please rise. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you make us glad with the yearly remembrance of the birth of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. 
Grant that we joyfully receive him as our Redeemer. We may with sure confidence behold him when he comes to be our judge. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And you may be seated. The first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 7, beginning at the 10th verse. And again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Christmas story begins in a most unlikely situation with a most unlikely cast of characters. The situation was a time of political worry and fretting. Judah was being assaulted. A siege was on its way by Israel and Syria after Judah refused to join an alliance with the mighty kingdom of Assyria. There seemed to be only two choices, to be destroyed by Israel or appeal to Assyria for help. To appeal to Assyria for help would be dangerous. They were powerful, and they devoured all in their paths. And alliances between equals meant little, much less an alliance that a mighty Assyria would form with a weak, tiny, miserable little country like Judah. The king, however, would opt to ally with Assyria. The characters? The king was Ahaz. And he was a miserable king. He worshipped other gods. He even was forced to introduce false gods into the temple, thereby desecrating it. Ahaz was no man of faith. The prophet speaking to him? The prophet was the mighty preacher, Isaiah. And he came offering a third choice, the choice of faith in the God who promised to be with his people and deliver them. Isaiah, provoked by the Spirit of God, offered Ahaz the opportunity of faith. Ask for a sign, he said. God will give it to you, Isaiah promised. Ahaz refused, using pious-sounding words, yet they were without faith. Isaiah therefore gave a sign to Ahaz, a promise that was most unlikely. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What an unlikely beginning this Christmas. An unbelieving king, a prophet sent by God, and this may be the most unlikely and the craziest thing of all, a virgin conceiving and giving birth while remaining a virgin. So unlikely, so unbelievable, and yet it's true. Look how desperate our need is. Our sin is so great, and the evil so vile, death so devastating, that the promise of help and aid required such an unlikely promise. A virgin will conceive. You know the fulfillment. That's why you're here tonight. You know that it came true. But much time had to pass. And then the angel Gabriel came to a virgin girl, and then God would truly live among his people. Then Jesus would be born into an unbelieving world, a world confused by hatred and evil, mourning death. Jesus, that is God with us, our Emmanuel, was born. A most unlikely promise given to a most unlikely king. But it is the promise that brought salvation to this world and brought this comfort amid our sin, amid the evil of our time, amid the death that we mourn. We have Emmanuel, we have Jesus, we have God with us. We continue with the hymn.
The second lesson is recorded in Micah chapter 5, beginning at the second verse. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient to days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As a teenager, I visited Plains, Georgia. If you don't know about Plains, Georgia, or remember hearing it before, it is the home of Jimmy Carter, the former President of the United States. There wasn't much there then, it's not much there now. A population of just over 700, and it was probably even smaller 30, 40 years ago. It is an unremarkable place. It has a few stores, a bar or two, a grain elevator, well, and a former president. It was and is like a lot of small rural towns that are dying. It's not the place that you would expect a president to come to from or retire to. But then Carter was an unlikely president, so you'd expect to find him in an unlikely place. In our minds, Bethlehem conjures up all sorts of romantic images Angels singing, shepherds watching their flocks by night, the home of David. Oh, what a place we imagine. But the reality was different. There wasn't really much left to Bethlehem. The prophet Micah, he was a prophet roughly at the same time of Isaiah, prophesied about Bethlehem. Did you hear his words? Did you hear Micah call the least among the cities? Did you hear Micah declare that it was so insignificant that it wasn't even worthy to be considered among the clan homes of Israel? This was nothing, a nothing town, a dying town, a, a town of no significance. Even the luster of mighty King David, the great shepherd king, a king after the very heart of God was now dimmed. He was nothing more than a distant memory. Bethlehem was a historical footnote and not much more. Yet our God chose to make his appearance as a man right there in a crazy little town. Unlikely, he was born of a virgin, born in an unlikely place, and there our God appeared. It was not too humble for Jesus. It set the tone for his entire life. For Jesus is the new shepherd king. Jesus is the great David's greater son, and he came to shepherd his people. Even that, however, took place in an unlikely way. Jesus shepherds his people in a completely unexpected manner, in an unexpected place. Jesus shepherded us from the cross. This is the place to where he calls his people. Around the cross we are gathered, finding forgiveness of our sins. To the cross we are shepherded, seeing the dying of death. At the cross we are shepherded to find a new life. Jesus is that good shepherd, but he leads us from the cross and leads to the cross and through the cross to eternal life. What an unlikely place to shepherd from. But we shouldn't be too surprised, though. Unlikely ways to work and serve his people have always been Jesus' mark. Look at the way it is happening today. The leadership of Jesus, that is Jesus shepherding his people, comes in an unlikely places that are easy to overlook and miss if we only see with our natural minds. With the eyes and minds of faith, though, we see clearly and find God at work. And what do we find? We find words that don't seem overly powerful to be the very gift of eternal life for those who believe. I forgive you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit are the very words of life. Scripture faithfully taught and explained by men who are greater, no greater or no less a speaker than anything else other than the words of life. 
And that alone is to bring comfort to hearts and bring us to the green pastures of God's Word and make them grow within our hearts and lives. Poured water, bread, and wine, they don't seem like very much. They are unlikely places for our Savior to be. But that is exactly where our Savior, Jesus, appears to us. It should have been easy, or would have been easy, excuse me, to despise Bethlehem. But to do so would have to miss this unlikely village that it was the birth of our Savior. It is easy to overlook the words spoken here in this congregation, the water applied, the bread and wine offered here. But to do so would mean missing the unlikely place where our Savior meets you, meets me, and meets the world. We continue with the hymn. We read responsively. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Timing is everything, we are told. We are told that there are tipping points in business, in life, in decision-making. We are taught, or told, to watch for the signs when the best chances for success is found, and then act, and act quickly. But what can we say about God's timing then? It doesn't seem to be very spectacular. There is a foreign government. The Holy Land is an occupied nation, and it has been for hundreds of years. The cost of living was about to go up. A census was underway in order to make more efficiently tax methods that the people would have to pay to a ruler living far off, and they would be more and more under his thumb. Yet, this is the time that God chose to send his son. 
According to Paul, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law. We may not have chosen such a time. It doesn't seem like a tipping point for you or me. But God chose this time. We would have waited for the ascendancy of an empire out of Palestine. We would have wanted to choose as the tipping point a time when the birth, the ministry, and the message of Jesus would get the most immediate airtime. That would be our time. But this was God's time. It was the fullness of time, the time that was meant to be. It was an unlikely time, but the right and proper time for God to act. It was an unlikely time, at least in the human fleshly way of thinking. But this was the right time for God to redeem those who were caught in sin, to buy back those caught in Satan's power. That time, for reasons only that God himself knows and can understand, was right and proper. God picks unlikely times to work. Do you want another example? We have made Christmas so often about family. We are told in secular Christmas music that this eve and tomorrow on Christmas Day, they're really about family gathering together around a fireplace. It is about the children we hear, and we say, this is about the children. This is all about their happiness and joy. Yet this year, the Christmas gatherings may be much different. You know, all we have to do is look around this room, and we see less people and more spread out. The pandemic has affected many things. I hear time and time again, how will Christmas ever be the same? Make no mistake, God has chosen this time to do his work. This is the time that God has chosen, an unlikely time to many, for us to look away from our families and our children, our standards of what are important. God has chosen this time for us to look away from what is so close and important to us and look to his family to see his son born of a woman, born under the law, born at an unlikely and an inconvenient time. Today is the day, the writer to the Hebrew tells us. Today is the day, the unlikely time in the eyes of the world, but the right and the best time in God's time. Today is the day for sin to be cast off, for faith in the babe born in Bethlehem to be seen as he ought, not as a symbol of purity, but to be seen as our Savior. God's time is often unlikely in our minds. Christ was born at an unlikely time to us. It's a time of foreign domination, slow communications, and without any doubt, a barbaric life. It was, however, God's time. Today is unlikely time for many to relook at their lives, for we have made this night of sentimentality and family. But this is a time that is God's time. And amidst this COVID pandemic, and against the upturning of our lives, this has become a time of repentance and salvation. It is time for us to form a new family, the family of God, that looks to Jesus in faith. An unlikely time? Yes but it is God's time. We continue with the sing, song.
there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Though we have a children's sermon marked, um, we obviously are not able this year to do it as we would like. And so we'll continue on with the hymn. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. We are, as a people, greatly concerned about the spread of diseases and viruses especially this year, and rightfully so. Our cars, our offices, and our homes are littered with hand sanitizer. 
Our classrooms are filled with wipes to clean desks, door handles, and who knows what else. Does it help? <laughs> Absolutely. But people still get sick. We just want to eliminate every chance encounter with germs and viruses that we can, and that is smart. That's why the shepherds, from our point of view, were unlikely visitors for the baby Jesus. They came, but they were not who we would have picked. Remember, they lived and they worked in fields. They weren't the clean-looking guys we see in our Boar's Head Festival. They lived and worked in the fields. They weren't the nice-looking, smiling children that we have in our school programs. No, they were dirty people. They would have been in fields for days, maybe even weeks at a time. Baths or showers were not available, and not too common anyway in that day. They would uh, encounter death on a regular basis. Remember the stories of David? He, as a young shepherd, took on lions and bears who attacked the flocks. These were men who were dirty, who would not be able to enter the temple many, many times because of their uncleanness. And yet, here are our unlikely visitors, the shepherds. In and of themselves, the shepherds were not worthy first visitors. Something happened, though. God called them through angels. Those who were unacceptable by most human standards were made acceptable. God had made the unacceptable acceptable. The dirty were made spiritually clean, and all by the call of God. What a great reminder for us. We gather here to visit Christ. But what kind of people are we? In and of ourselves, we all too often are modern-day shepherds. Sin, sin clings to us, death has touched us, we walk in its shadow. To come into the presence of the holy God, in whom is pure life, into the presence of His Son, who brings pure life, it's audacious and bold. We have no right, for we are not holy, but marked by sin and death. Yet, here we are. We have come. And why? We come because we've been called by God, even as the shepherds were. We have been called and made clean by Christ through faith alone. It is much like the parable that Jesus told. The wanderers and the bystanders were invited into the king's banquet. They came to celebrate with the king, but they needed to be, to be dressed appropriately. Their average, mundane, everyday clothes were simply not acceptable. So the king gave them new garments to wear. One man, however, chose to enter without this garment. Do you remember what happened? He was thrown out. We are those this day who have been invited to visit with the Christ child. We come into his presence only through faith, hearing the call of God, trusting that he who calls has clothed us with his holiness, his righteousness, his goodness. Oh, how beautiful this is, how true it is. We can gather here tonight or tomorrow on Sunday without faith, but then it would bring no benefit at all. Only through faith, like the faith of the shepherds, can we marvel at the gift that God has given for our benefit. Unlikely visitors, the shepherds are and we are. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. To God alone be all glory. Amen. We continue.
please rise? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, he, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Came flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I'm said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known.
As we light the candles tonight, we remind you, please, uh, do not tip a lit candle, but if you're lighting your candle, uh, take the unlit candle and put it in a flame of the, of the held upright lit one.
At this time, gently blow out the candles, and you may be seated as we worship the Lord with our offerings. We ask for the parents to also help their children on the parts marked kids. And we pray. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who love the man of the darkness, amen. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Let us call upon his holy name. 
We rejoice that you were born among us to help us in our need. By the miracle of your strong love, forgive our sins and aid us in our lives from day to day. Your strength was shown not only at the cross, but also at the open tomb. Come to our feeble hearts with power to redeem and redirect. You are our only source of everlasting life. Come, claim us as your children now that we may live forever in your care. Attune our ears to hear again the angels' song of God's goodwill for all the world, that we may join them in our songs of praise. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and grant us peace. Amen. <laughs>